Happy New Year to you. I want to get rid of the stupid racist and homophobes and bigots. The people who wrote the Constitution did not understand that slavery was a bad thing. The genesis of impeachment was um, when the, the president was running for office. When they don't, when they're deliberate, put them in jail. That's what I, I I'm not joking about this. I'm not joking about this. I come from a family where, in an area where it's coal mining in Scranton. Anybody who could go down 300 to 3,000 feet in the mine, sure can learn how to program as well. <laughs> Freedom prospers when religion is vibrant and the rule of law under God is acknowledged. An informed patriot is what we want. Welcome to American Family Radio's Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Muscular Christianity. Where we relentlessly explore the intersection of truth and politics. The trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant. It's just that they know so much that isn't so. Now, here's your host, Brian Fisher. Howdy and welcome to the first broadcast of 2020 of Focal Point, the American Family Radio Network. I am Brian Fishy, your congenial, convivial, amiable, and effervescent host. As always. And as you hear, Jeff and Rob both here, three amigos are writing again Woo! back at full strength. Yeah. Happy New Year to everybody. Just a quick word, I want to let you know that you can get podcasts of the program Every day at AFR.net. You miss the program. Don't have to miss a thing. You can go to AFR.net. Scroll down to the pod. Click on the podcast button. Scroll down to the focal point logo. Click on that. You can access every day's program. We upload it about 15 minutes after the program is over. You can subscribe to the podcast if you'd like. Make sure you never miss a program. We even publish it with a little bit of a table of contents. So you can find your way around the program. Also want to remind you that we have an opinion site, The Stand, at afa.net. Jeff, could you check real quickly and see if I had a column I submitted I today? I forgot I to check and see if it was up. But you can get the opinion pieces that are produced here through American Family Association at afa.net. Uh, is it called Why Political Campaigns Get Nasty? Yes. Yes, it's the, up. And the title of the column is Why Political Campaigns... Get nasty. You know, we're in the middle of a very nasty one. we got one side trying to decapitate the other guy politically, take him completely out. We have just furious, raging rhetoric being used primarily from the opponents of the president. Well, why does that happen? Why do political campaigns get so nasty and so bitter and so divisive? I have a suggestion in my column today at AFA.net and encourage you to go there and uh, check it out. All right, uh, this is uh, January the second, first day of broadcasting in the new year. Let's turn our attention, as we customarily do, to the nautical charts by which the USS Focal Point is navigated. That is the Word of God. We are in the book of Acts right now. Remember, this is the legal brief that Luke prepared diligently researched nothing but eyewitness testimony to help Paul's attorney, Theophilus, prepare him for his appearance before Nero. So this is a legal brief for Paul's defense attorney in his appearance before Nero, which was the ultimate court of appeal for a Roman citizen, which Paul was. Now we're getting, well, now we're getting to the third, we're starting into the third section of Luke's book, the book of Acts. In chapter 12, verse 24, we find the phrase, The word of God increased and multiplied. Now, this is a marker that Luke uses all the way through the book of Acts. The word of God increased and multiplied. That's his marker to indicate that this chapter is closing. And now I'm getting ready to open a brand new chapter, brand new segment in my record of the expansion of the gospel. It's a transition marker from one segment to the next. Remember in Acts 1.8, uh, Luke records that Jesus had told them that you are to take be my witnesses, first of all, in Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, and third, to the ends of the earth. Now, the task of getting the message out to Jerusalem 
was completed by chapter 6, verse 6, which says the word of God continued to increase. So Luke's record of that chapter of the expansion of the gospel is complete. Now he's moving into the next segment, which is the expansion of the gospel to Judea and Samaria. And so the gospel continued to penetrate Judea and Samaria, and that project was done. That's why we read in chapter 12, 24, the word of God increased and multiplied. So the word had gone to Judea and Samaria now. All that was left is for the word to be taken to the end of the earth. And that's what the rest of the book of Acts is really all about. Now we're told that the disciples, the apostles, were sent out in chapter 13, verse 1, from Antioch, which is a major city in the Roman Empire, and became the main sending church at this time in the history of the church. Now we're told there were both prophets and teachers in Antioch. Now a prophet... And this is true for New Testament prophets, just like it was for Old Testament prophets. The definition is exactly the same. <clears throat> same. New Testament prophets had a spiritual gift to receive revelation directly from the Lord and communicate that revelation to the community of faith. They were agents of revelation. But also there were teachers in the body. Now, those who had the gift of teaching did not receive revelation directly from God. Their gift was being able to clearly teach, to explain, and to illustrate revelation that had been given to others. That's the gift I believe God has given to me. God's only spoken to me once in my entire life. I'll have to tell you about that sometime if I haven't. But I know that God has spoken in the re revelation that he has preserved for us in the Scripture, and that's my job as the job of most pastors and teachers today in the body of Christ is to teach what God has revealed to others. Now, it's interesting to note that also in Antioch was a guy by the name of Simeon who was called Niger. Niger is the Latin word for black. He very likely came from the continent of Africa. So the church from the very beginning was racially integrated, racially diverse from day one. We also have a mention of Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene was also in northern Africa in what is today Libya. Now we're also told there was a guy by the name of Manaean who was a lifelong friend of Herod Agrippa who was in charge, was the Tetrarch of Galilee. So there was even a, a believer inside the administration of Herod Agrippa, one of his lifelong friends. He was a dude by the name of Manaean. He was a friend, had grown up with Herod Agrippa. The Greek word that describes him indicates that they had been friends from youth. So Herod Agrippa would have had the opportunity to hear the gospel from a good, close, and lifelong friend, but it never penetrated to Herod Agrippa's heart. Now, the early church, we see, practiced the lost art of fasting. It's while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting that the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So they, uh, so they prayed and fasted. Then the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Then they prayed some more. They fasted some more. And they laid hands on them as a sign that these two men, Paul and Barnabas, were going out with their authority, and with the blessing that they had called down from heaven upon them, the anointing of the Spirit that they had asked God to bestow on these two servants. So they take off. The first place they go is Cyprus. That was the home of Barnabas. This is the beginning of the first of three, Paul's three missionary apostolic journeys. Took about a year and a half for this first journey. Probably took place in about 46 47 A.D., about 13 or 14 years after the resurrection of Christ. Now, they get to Cyprus. They go to a place called Salamis, which was the main port. Cyprus was an island there in the Mediterranean. And then they went to Paphos, which is about 90 miles from the port of Salamis. This is where the seat of the Roman government was in Cyprus. And there they run into a guy by the name of Bar-Jesus, now, Bar is an Aramaic word for son, so this man's name literally was the son of Jesus. But we're told by Luke that he was a magician, which means, now it doesn't mean he pulled rabbits out of hats and juggled balls and stuff. It meant that he was a practitioner of the occult. He was dabbling in demonic powers. He was skilled 
at using the occult arts and the powers of Satan to do his thing. And we're told that he was with uh, Sergius Paulus, who was the Roman proconsul. He was the chief Roman official on the island of Cyprus, and this guy was tight with him. Apparently he did things with his uh, occult powers that impressed Sergius Paulus, and so they were hanging out together. And he got, he got incensed when Paul and Barnabas came. He didn't want anybody horning in on his invitations to speak at prayer breakfasts and offer invocations at government events. So he tried to make trouble for Paul and Barnabas by alien, trying to alienate, prevent the proconsul from hearing uh, the word of God. By the way, this Sergius Paulus, his name is found in a number of inscriptions in the Mediterranean from this time. Every time. Every time, ladies and gentlemen, we can lay the scripture alongside what we know to be true historically, what we know to be true archaeologically, it lines up every time. Do not doubt this book. Now we're told in verse 9 that Saul is referred to here for the first time as Paul. That was his Latin name. That was his Roman name. Now, when he went into the Gentile world, went into the Roman Empire, he went by the name of Saul. And this is what he said directly to Elimus, this Bar-Jesus dude, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, meaning trickery or fraud, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Now, Paul says, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And we're told immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him. Now, this is exactly, remember, how God caught Paul's attention. Remember, he was blinded for three days before Ananias laid his hands on him, and he received uh, his sight. And one of the reasons for this is that when you're flat on your back, the only way to look is up. That's how God got Paul's attention. He's trying to do the same thing with the Elimus. Now, we have no indication that it worked. No indication that this brought Elimus, that it humbled him before God. So sometimes these things humble people, sometimes they don't. Now, the proconsul, the Sergius Paulus, he was seeing all this going on. And he believed when he saw what had occurred. He saw the way Paul spoke to him, not exactly from the Andrew Carnegie school of how to win friends and influence people, you son of the devil, but it was the truth. And it tells us that sometimes there is a place for direct, honest rebuke of those who are enemies of the gospel and the cross of Christ. And we see also, by the way, that Luke has a particular interest in how Roman officials responded to the message of Christianity. We'll see that as we go. He knew that would be of interest to Nero, would be important information for his attorney to have in defending Christianity and defending the apostle before Nero would cut some serious ice with him if some of his best officials, some of the best and most skilled Roman officials in the empire had embraced the faith and become followers of Jesus Christ. Well, let's take these things and go to prayer. If you'd be kind enough to join me. Lord Jesus, I pray in your name today that you will set all of us. I pray for my family. I pray for the listening audience of Focal Point. Every man, woman, and child right now within the sound of my voice. Pray for our elected officials, for our governors, for our mayors, and for our president, President Trump. That you will set us apart for the work to which you have called us. May we know your calling on our lives and fulfill the destiny you have for us. Grant us trusted friends and mentors who will help us to recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking into our lives and who will assist us in fulfilling your calling on our lives through their prayers. I pray that each one of us will be sent on our way by the Holy Spirit, guided in each step of our journey. Give us opportunity to proclaim the Word of God in each place we find ourselves. We ask you to stir up in every one of our public officials a hunger for your word. May they each seek out spirit-filled servants of yours who will impart your truth to them. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
You shall have no other gods before me. Here we go. This is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on American Family Radio. Howdy, welcome back to Focal Point on American Family Radio. Brian Fisher is my name. Glad to have you in the conversation today, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. You know, this is a time typically where people do kind of year in review stuff. And we want to do just a t- we still take a minute. You know, Jeff and I chat about this this morning. He's been working on some of the major stories that have to do with Christianity over the course of the past year. And Jeff, what do you got for us? Let's uh, kind of review the year together. Well, I, I just wanted to mention, I think I narrowed it down to the top five stories of 2019. If uh, you want to go through that list, maybe we'll take a look at some of my top choices. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I'm going off the list that you and I uh, talked about together, starting with uh, Kanye. That's a pretty big story. Yeah, Kanye had a pretty big um, album this year. Uh, you might want to say Lauren Daigle did also, but... Uh, Kanye made quite a splash because he was so public in his profession and conversion to Christ. So, And there was a lot of controversy around it. A lot of people still question his sincerity, but uh, yeah, it was a big story. So they yeah. got a lot of people talking. And, and you know what? I had a son in college. He's a Kanye fan, and he's talking about Christ uh, uh, again for the first time in a in a long time with us. Wow, so. well, that is great news. Yeah, and who knows? I mean, it seems to me like he's he's the real deal. I mean, we saw that with Bob Dylan; he had a fairly dramatic conversion, and then he flamed out after a couple of three years. Uh, so we'll have to you have to wait and see. But 
It seems so, from what I can tell at this point, to be like a genuine deal. Now, yeah, another opinion isn't that. It was just, it was a big story, I think, yeah. this year. And yeah, it was no question. It was a big story. Another one that we uh, spent a fair amount of time on is what happened to Chick Fil A. Yeah, the fall of Chick Fil A. I think I would name it uh, the the kind of uh, underhanded and deceitful kind of way they went about reallocating some of their funds and donations to non-Christian and pro-LGBT groups. So taking away money from Salvation Army and others. So uh, that's kind of a big deal. Well, and not only taking money away from Salvation Army, but giving it to other groups, like the money they used to give to the Salvation Army, they're giving now to something called Covenant House, which is geared toward teenagers, but they're very heavily into the transgender movement, which means that any, any teenager struggling with homosexuality that goes to them is not going to be helped to get out of that lifestyle. They're going to be taught that it's, hey, perfectly okay, hey, yield to those inclinations, yield to those impulses, nothing uh, wrong with that. And they're also loading up girls, pregnant teenagers in vans, Covenant House is, and taking them to Planned Parenthood for abortions. That's where the Chick-fil-A money is going, to pay for vans to take pregnant teenagers to Planned Parenthood clinics. That's where Chick-fil-A's money is going. That's where your money you spend on chicken sandwiches at Chick-fil-A is going. Yeah, and uh, I want to emphasize these aren't in order of the most important or this or that. I just picked the top five. The uh, The next one would be uh, the Jack Phillips ruling in the Supreme Court and many other cases that have come before the Supreme Court that seem to really uh, have changed direction in religious liberties in the United States. So that's a good good. Story yeah, that is. About. You know, in the reality, when it comes to the homosexual agenda, Jack Phillips is the masterpiece cake shop owner. He got taken into court because he politely declined. He wasn't angry about it. He wasn't mean. He just politely declined to bake a cake to solemnize or to celebrate a homosexual wedding. He says, I'm a Christian. I follow the Bible. I follow the straight paths of the Lord, to borrow a phrase from Paul today in, in Acts 13. And that's not something that my conscience will permit me to do. So he got dragged into court, uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, we're going to vacate this ruling that he's got to cough up all this money or whatever, because this was clearly the decision by the Colorado Civil Rights Commission was clearly motivated by animus. Didn't solve the problem, but they he won in that case. And then uh, we've seen, uh, oh, good, you had something to add on that, no, Jeff? I was just going to tell you what number four was. Uh, okay, go ahead, hit the it. stories is the rise of persecution against Christians uh, across the world. But uh, I, I think uh, we've gotten a lot of stories out of China that is truly disturbing. But there, the, the, let's put it this way. There has always been a lot of Christian persecution throughout the world, but the, the media and people have not been reporting on it. There are new things happening that are bringing more and more attention to this. We can't ignore this any longer. Yeah, you know, I read a story this morning, speaking of that, that China now has taken, the government of China, Communist China, has taken direct control of every church in China. Hmm. And they are demanding that every church in China become a mouthpiece for the Communist Party. Mm-hmm. They have to puff and promote the Communist Party and the Communist Party lines. They no longer have the freedom to declare the gospel as they see fit. They're now going to be, well, they're going to be subject to persecution. Yeah, those are the churches that they haven't blown up. They're even rewriting scriptures to uh, to, to more of a political theme to it. Also jailing a lot of uh, the pastors and members of the early reign church and many others of the underground churches there in China. And not to mention the Muslims as well. They have the encampments... uh, uh, like what do you, what do you call them internment camps for, yeah, for Muslims? Camps with some pretty camps. shocking stories coming out of there, but that does not leave out the fact that they are uh, persecuting Christians as well. Yeah, and like Jeff was saying, you alluded to this, but they're ordering the church to rewrite the Bible so that it doesn't conflict with Communist Party doctrine. So that is going on in China. But there's a right. little bit of good news out of that. Po- oh, you want to add another thought, Jeff? No, to kind of going in line with the Chinese pers- persecuting the Christians. They're also trying to clamp down on Hong Kong, and that's another great story that comes out of there. Not only the population of, of Hong Kong standing up against 
mainland China, but the way they've been doing it, uh, I don't. I, it would be hard for anybody to forget the time that they were protesting and they, in unison, were singing, saying hallelujah to the Lord. And it was an amazing moment, amazing moment in Hong Kong history. Yeah, it kind of reminds you of the same spirit that animated the, uh, the colonists in 1776 when they were seeking to break free yeah. of the yoke of the crown. No king but King Jesus. That was one of their, one of their mottos. Yeah, they, and uh, from what I'm reading, there's only about 10% of the Hong Kong population is Christian. But as they started singing that song, every, per, every protester in Hong Kong recognized that song and joined in. And I thought it was a, a really special moment. Well, you know, it's like Jesus said, uh, you know, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, smallest seed, metaphorically, of all the gardeners, but you plant it. In the right soil, it becomes a shrub that's big enough. It becomes like a tree where birds can actually build nests in its branches. So we pray that that's what's happening in, uh, in Hong Kong. By the way, let's uh, shifting to Iraq just for a moment. You've probably been following the story about the storming of the American embassy there. Let's not forget that the American embassy, an American embassy is sovereign United States soil. So when they attack one of our embassies, that is a direct attack on the United States of America. It, it represents an invasion of American soil. And Donald Trump has made it clear, not going to let this go unchallenged, not going to let us go, let it go without a response. Troops are being mobilized. They're being deployed to respond uh, to this thing. You know, it's interesting. You know, when they attacked our U.S. consulate, that's American soil over in Libya, Benghazi, what did, uh, what did President Obama do? He went to bed. Then he got up and went to Las Vegas to party down with Jay-Z and Beyonce. What happens when an American embassy is invaded under Donald Trump's leadership? The Marines are sent in to take care of of uh, the problem. Uh, all right. Uh, yesterday, by the way, the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation issued by President Abraham Lincoln. And remember, when they got around to officially making slavery illegal in the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. This was all done by a Republican president. It was a Republican president that uh, was in charge when the slaves were emancipated, it was a Republican House of Representatives and a Republican Senate that passed the 13th Amendment that made slavery illegal, passed the 14th Amendment that made former slaves citizens of the United States, and the 15th Amendment that gave them the right to vote. Every one of those vigorously, fiercely opposed by the Democrat uh, Party. Now, uh, let's uh, grab uh, clip number two, Pete Buttigieg. This is a perfect example of the absolute, in the, the ignorance, I mean, the utter, total, abysmal ignorance of the Democratic candidates for president. You know, and Pete Buttigieg is young. He's kind of winsome. He's uh, very polished in the way he speaks, so people believe him. By the way, millennials don't want to have anything to do with Pete Buttigieg. I mean, his support among the youngest voters right now is down in single digits. You know, you'd think he'd be their guy, but the guy that millennials like is Bernie Sanders, the old grandpa that sits in his rocking chair on the porch and yells at you to get off his lawn. That's the guy <laughs> that millennials are supporting. It's hard, it's hard to believe. You know, and Sanders got more, raised more money last quarter than any Democrat candidate, candidate, like $34 million. Donald Trump raised like $44 million, beat them all. And Donald Trump is sitting on $100 million. Right now, he's got campaign coffers stuffed with $100 million uh, in, in assets to take in to the campaign. But anyway, let's listen to Pete Buttigieg, clip number two. Similarly, the amendment process, they were wise enough to realize that they didn't have all the answers and that some things would change. Uh, a good example of this is 
something like slavery or civil rights. Uh, for uh, It's a, an embarrassing thing to admit, but the people who wrote the Constitution did not understand that slavery was a bad thing and did not respect civil rights. Uh, and yet they created a framework uh, so that as the generations came to understand that that was important, they could write that into the Constitution too and ensure true equal protection for all of us. That's just, I mean, that's just lies and ignorance and deception and foolishness from the beginning of that soundbite to the end, to say that the founders did not understand that slavery was a bad thing. They did. A lot of the founding fathers invade against slavery. They called it a dark institution, an evil institution. But in the process of hammering out a constitution, they realized that in the southern states, what became the Democratic states, the Democrat states of America, there was such a fierce attachment to the institution of slavery that there would be no way for them to produce a document that everybody could agree on uh, if they outlawed slavery. That's what stopped it. I mean, Democrats stopped slavery from being outlawed at the beginning. In the North, they were ready to do that. But they couldn't do it because of the Democrats in uh, the South. So they came to a compromise that allowed them to form the Constitution. Uh, and they basically, you know what, what the Confederate States, what became the Confederate States, what they wanted is they wanted every slave to be worth a, a one vote in determining representation. Remember, in the House of Representatives, representation was determined by your population. So they wanted every slave to count. And the anti-slavery North said, no, we can't, we can't have that because they're slaves. If we grant that status to the institution of slavery, we're giving it a legal status that we just cannot afford to give it at this time. So they said, we'll grant three-fifths representation to every slave. Not full representation in the House of Representatives, but three-fifths. That was an anti-slavery provision. It's presented as a pro-slavery uh, position uh, or plank, but it was not. It was an anti-slavery provision. It was the best that they could do to limit the institution of slavery uh, at the time. So they were against it. If they weren't against it, you never would have had that provision in the Constitution at all. Why? Because if they weren't against the institution of slavery, they wouldn't have fought represent the representation issue. They fought it because they did not want slavery to be officially normalized, officially legalized in the United States of America. It took a civil war to bring that institution to an end. Now, by the way, let's grab clip number one. This is Don Lemon celebrating uh, Christmas Eve, and this guy was like loaded to the gills when he Again. did this. But I want you to listen very carefully to Don Lemon's language here. We were talking about persecution around the world. I mean, if, if people like Don Lemon, remember, he's, he's on CNN, which fancies itself the arbiter of what's news. And this is what Don Lemon had to say about you and me. Listen very carefully to his language, clip one. I just want us to come back together again as a country. I want us to stop being so sensitive. I want to get rid of the stupid racist and homophobes and bigots. And I'm sick of that. I'm sick of promoting that and hearing about it. I know. It's, it's unfortunate. Disgusting. All right. So uh, that's uh, Don Lemon. Uh, I am sick of the racists and the homophobes and the bigots. And I want to get rid of them. He doesn't say I want to debate them. I want to discuss this issue. He says I want to get rid of the stupid, racist, and homophobes and bigots. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of promoting that. I'm sick of hearing about it. It is disgusting. Well, uh, Don Lemon, I'm afraid that you are going to have to put up with it. You're going to have to hear about it because we are not going anywhere. A couple of other items before we get to the break here. You know, the leader of this attack on our embassy in Iraq was welcomed by Barack Obama to the White House back in 2011. 
when the prime minister it was in, uh, when the prime minister of Iraq paid Barack Obama a visit, he had the guy that headed this riot up right alongside him. Here's Twyla Brace, president of CCHF, with today's Health Freedom Minute. I was one of 18 healthcare leaders selected. American Family Radio. You're listening to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Brian Fisher. Howdy and welcome back to Focal Point on American Family Radio. Focal Point, the home of the fastest 60 minutes in American media. So many stories, so little time. Buckle up because we are heading to the home stretch, heading for the checkered flag. Got a lot of content we want to give you before the end of the program today. Ireland has passed a new law. This is now a law in Ireland. This is not something they're just talking about or they're proposing. This is something they have enacted into law that you will be forced to buy an electric car within 10 years. You will not be allowed to drive a fossil-fueled vehicle uh, after the year 2050, they're trying to go completely carbon neutral by the year 2050. If you want to buy a new car in 10 years, it's going to have to be an electric car. Yeah, it's time to start a donkey cart factory in, in <laughs> Ireland, I yeah. think. Yeah, you because know? <laughs> they're going to they're gonna need them. You know, and he, he, I just, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, I want to be careful here because I, I know people, I mean, uh, m- my family, I have friends, I don't know if I have a friend that drives, a Tesla, but people in my family do have friends that drive Teslas and apparently are pretty enamored of them. You know, and I've told you the problem with a Tesla is that when the battery dies, it becomes a brick. 
I mean, you can't just roll it off the side of the road. It is dead. It's absolutely, completely, totally dead weight. You can't even tow it. you got to get a crane to lift it up on the back of the tow truck. Now, here's a little story from Car and Driver magazine. I'm just going to read the first paragraph here from this news article. Car and Driver reports that a Tesla Model 3 belonging to a staff photographer... So this is car and driver. <clears throat> I got a great idea. They say, let's buy a Tesla for our photographer so we can drive it and he can take pictures of it and tell us what a wonderful vehicle it is. It broke down in the driveway of his parents' home while he was visiting for Christmas holidays. He got a notification from his Tesla car on his iPhone and this was the message I'm quoting, this is on his iPhone, message from his car that the Tesla has suffered a failure and will no longer drive. Uh, and they said this, the car and driver said this is the first time that they've ever seen a long-term car suffer a catastrophic failure while parked. They've seen this happen while they're driving. But here's what Car and Driver said. Not only is this the first time we've ever had a long-term car suffer a catastrophic failure, it's also an extraordinarily rare case of any car leaving us stranded. Something completely unacceptable for any new vehicle, particularly one that costs $57,690, had 5,200 miles on it. Uh, even our problem-plagued Alfa Romeo was at least able to limp to the dealer following each one of its numerous uh, issues. Uh, yeah, Jeff? Uh, also, there's uh, uh, some new data that's coming out as more and more people are owning electric cars. Initially, the yearly upkeep cost of maintenance is, is, is lower. That is, is until the batteries start wearing out. Then it, you start to see a lot of problems. It's very expensive, far more expensive to upkeep an electric car as the batteries start wearing out if you can find somebody in your area to work on it. So that can, it's e that can even do a it. a lot of unforeseen challenges to electric car owners. Yeah, those batteries are just enormously expensive, and th they're enormously, I don't know if com complicated is the right word, but it's a labor-intensive job to replace electric car batteries in a Tesla or any other uh, electric car. Here's what Car and Driver went on to say. After a two-day wait, we were informed that there are issues with the rear drive unit, the pyrotechnic battery disconnect. I guess that's the battery disconnect that keeps the thing from bursting into flames. That's one of the things that happens because these are lithium-ion. Remember, those are the ones that brought down that Flight 370, that Malaysian flight, it went into the ocean because it was carrying a load of these lithium-ion batteries. They caught fire. You can't put them out. Once those fires start, you can't put them out, and it brought the plane down. So they got some kind of pyrotechnic battery disconnect, apparently, to start the thing from bursting into flames. And the 12-volt battery had problems. They're waiting for parts. No estimated time was given for when we might be able to see scrambling for backup transportation. All right, so that's catastrophic failure for a Tesla. Right at the same time that Ireland has said that's the only kind of car you're going to be able to buy in 10 years. Good luck with coal all fired. of that. What's that? Coal-fired coal cars. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, and Jeff's right. We call them, I call them coal-fired cars. That's what we call them here because where do you get the electricity for those things? Yeah. You have to burn coal so you can charge your Tesla up with electricity. Rob? Yeah. One of the questions I have is uh, Ireland going to subsidize their residents to buy these cars because they're higher priced than anything on the market. And you can't buy used ones because they're not on the market. Yeah. Well, so in this Tesla, how, how, fifty. What, what did car and driver say? $58,000 bucks, $57,000 yeah. and something to buy this car. Yeah, you know, which is nice if you can afford it, but how many people can do that? Not me. Not me. <laughs> no. So... All right, uh, well, let's do, a, I had a couple of sound bites that I've been keeping for several days, kind of year in review. I've got a whole bunch we'll try to have to save for tomorrow. But um, 
This uh, Let's go to clip number 11. We've played this quote before back in the day. This is Melissa Harris Perry. This is a flashback to 2014, I think, back when she was still a weekend host at MSNBC. You know, a biblical view is that children are the responsibility of parents. Parents are the ones that have uncontested authority to bring their children up, to discipline them, to raise them, to make medical decisions for them, to make ethical, uh, educational decisions for them, and so forth. But Melissa Harris Perry, speaking for regressives all across the Fruited Plain, has a different idea, clip 11. We have never invested as much in public education as we should have because we've always had kind of a private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. You know, there were some video game like it was a Japan-produced video game, and you had military bases. And at one point in the game, the, the, the game says to you, all your bases are belong to us. That's what Melissa Harris Perry is saying. All your kids are belong to us. You only think they're your kids. They are the kids that belong to the collective. That's socialism uh, right there. It all sounds kind of nice. we got to... Everybody's got to accept responsibility for the kids. They're all our kids. It all sounds good until you start boiling it down. Now, um, clip number 12. This is Eleanor Clift. She's on the McLaughlin Group. This is another flashback to 2014. And remember, when you had the attack on the consulate, Andrew Stevens, who was our ambassador there, he died uh, in that fire that consumed the compound. And... So people are out there accusing uh, those that attacked the compound of murder and even blaming this on the Obama administration for permitting this. Remember, Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State at the time. She ignored a 108 requests from Andrew Stevens, from Ambassador Stevens, to bulk up the security at the embassy and at the consulate. He knew they were... They were woefully unprepared for an attack. He knew there were violent and hostile forces that were circulating uh, around Benghazi and in Libya. He pleaded with Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, for increased security. He got turned down 108 times. But here's uh, Eleanor Cliff saying, no, this wasn't murder at all. Let's listen. Every media organization has investigated this to death. This animates the right wing of the Republican Party. And I would like to point out that Ambassador Stevens was not murdered. He died of smoke inhalation in the safe room in oh, that CIA installation. Been, <laughs> so he wasn't murdered. He died yeah. of smoke inhalation. It's kind of like me saying, uh, that guy wasn't blown up. That guy wasn't murdered. He was blown up by a heat-seeking missile. He wasn't murdered. So, I mean, it's just uh, just nuts the extent to which they will go to try to insulate Barack Obama from criticism. All right. Now, here is um, Shepard Smith uh, of uh, Fox News back before he got cashiered. I mean, and where Fox News is at right now, where it's going, if you're out of phase with Fox News, you really got to be out of phase because they are lurching rapidly to the left. But here's um, Shepard Smith talking about Cuba, clip 13. You know the fear among anybody who's ever been there or cares at all about the Cuban people, as so many of us do, the last thing they need is a Taco Bell and a Lowe's. I mean, <laughs> we, don't, we don't need a... Toilet paper, toothbrushes, right? But toothpaste. You, but you know, it's one big idea and it all sort of comes together and you wonder, are we about to get up in there and ruin that place? <laughs> <laughs> are we about... Shepard Smith doesn't want us to get involved in Cuba because we might ruin that tropical paradise. <laughs> and I've told you, I've been there. I, don't, I, I, I never tire of repeating this story. When we traveled to Cuba, was on a, an evangelistic type trip, so we were permitted to go. It was one of the few kinds of travel you were allowed, kind of humanitarian type travel. 
And we were emphatically told, if you're going to go to Cuba as a tourist, you've got to pack your own toilet paper. <laughs> Don't even think about showing up in Cuba unless you're packing a roll of TP, TP in your suitcase because you can't guarantee that you'll find it anywhere. And here's yeah. Jeff's favorite part. Jeff, what's your favorite part of this whole deal? <laughs> the donkey carts. Well, donkey carts. And, and we saw people driving around and, donkey carts. And the fact that a toilet seat cover is a luxury. Luxury, yeah. Not a toilet seat cover. A toilet, toilet seat, seat. Oh, toilet was a, seat. is a luxury item. Oh, you yeah, couldn't even expect to go into a hotel room and find uh, toilet seats. Right. On your toilets. That's Cuba. So, yeah, we don't want to go up there. We just might ruin that uh, <laughs> paradise. Yeah. You know, and we talked about this before. They're so backwards in their machinery that they're, they're back to using oxen and carts and old-fashioned plows to do their agriculture. You know, and one of the things that, that strikes you when you're there is all these cars are classics. They're, you know, like I have a 65 Pontiac Le Mans. You know, if you love old cars, man, you think, man, this is paradise. You got all these 57 Chevys and these 58 whatevers and these 63 yeah. whatevers. Well, the reason is you can't get a new car <laughs> in Cuba. You can't buy a car that was manufactured after 1957 because they won't let them in the country. So the only way they can find a car is fix up some old clunker and drive it around. Now, they're spiffy-looking cars, but there's a reason for it because they can't get something that's any newer and any more reliable. And most of those cars are American cars that were from back in the 50s and yeah. 60s when we were they were an open nation. Yeah, back so. when we, we could still get our goods yeah. in there and ship our cars there. Yeah, a lot of those 57 Chevrolets with the fins and stuff all over the place down there. All right, uh, speaking of Cuba, here's Brian Williams. And this is right after Castro's death when they're announcing Castro's uh, death and the loss of this marvel of a leader, this marvel of a political figure who has done so much to bring his people out of darkness into light. Here is Brian Williams talking about Castro's Cuba. Listen to this. It's still one of those nations where you see donkey carts alongside uh, cars, trucks, and buses in downtown Havana because that's exactly what they'd rather have for transportation. <laughs> yeah. Donkey carts. They drive <laughs> around in donkey carts because that's what they prefer. Well, that's my market. I'm gonna I'm gonna open a donkey cart <laughs> factory, one in Ireland and one in Cuba, and and retire. <laughs> Yeah, well, you can, you, you'll make bank on that uh, program. Wow. All right, well, that's enough uh, foolishness for today. I've got a whole bunch of good sound bites we'll save for uh, tomorrow, but it might be worth noticing while we're still uh, or noting while we're still talking about the Iran Iraq situation. Remember, Barack Obama gave them a hundred access to one hundred and fifty billion dollars in frozen assets. One hundred and fifty billion dollars in frozen assets. Uh, Barack Obama said they've been frozen because you've been bad actors. I'm going to, because I'm the light bringer, I'm going to unfreeze those assets, those $150 billion, and I'm going to send you $2 billion to release our Americans from, from hostage. You're holding them hostage. You kidnapped them. I'm going to send you $2 billion in pallets uh, in planes. We're going to fly you cash, cold, hard, $2 billion worth of cash, and, of course, Iran immediately turned all that money into terrorism. They put it all to work to expand their uh, terrorism uh, organizations and uh, uh, operations. And uh, it's interesting that Donald Trump, with the sanctions that he's imposed on Iraq, completely reversed this $200 billion windfall that Morocco gave them. That's all gone. They're back to square one. Well, that's it for today. God bless you. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio. Faith. Family. Freedom. American Family Radio. It's a little thing. It's just another item on the list of things I need to get for my family. Except that it's American.
I need you to call Dr. Bird's office ASAP. I cannot refill this prednisone prescription without a, a request from his office, and because this is this is from Dr. Hill in Tupelo. Oh, okay. I thought we were okay, but we're not, and we're. So he needs to he needs to call the CVS, CVS the specialty pharmacy, or no, just the regular this number that regular pharmacy. That's that's the one the target one out of target, yeah. okay. 